So just, uh, we were asked to give a presentation on some issues we've had in the energy sector and different ways we've tried to approach different projects down that area. So first I wanna give you a real quick background on some of the things we've had to battle and why we had to try and come up with these different ideas. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm pretty sure most of you guys have heard about this. Uh, we have uh, the Eagle Ford Shale Formation in the southern part of our district. And to give you a better idea of what's going on in that area, the, the uh, Railroad Commission has actually made this video that shows the propagation of well sites that have been permitted since 2008 all the way up until I think it was like March 2016. And if you guys have ever seen a movie called Outbreak where it shows like someone getting infected and how quickly it can spread out, man, that's exactly what this is like, man. It, it is growing immensely. It's huge. So, is this a laser pointer? So for San Antonio, we got uh, 12 different counties that we're in charge of. Uh, the ones that Jessica is the air engineer over is here in Frio, Atascosa, and McMullen. So by far and away, McMullen has just being, been completely destroyed and, and overrun by oil wells that are just growing all over the place. Uh, I'm just going to try and fast forward for the sake of brevity. So you, you get all the way to where we're up right now, and you can just see that all those permitted oil sites have just grown immensely. You know, this whole area right here is completely covered by oil sites. So what does that mean for us in terms of uh, traffic that's been hitting that road? You know, uh, you got the, the standard trucks that go through that area, but then whenever they're trying to build these oil sites and try and go out there and frack them, they bring in these heavy loads. So this is a regular occurrence. You know, you see these super heavy loads, and then every now and then you get these, are you kidding me? What the fuck is this, man? <laughs> So this is actually one vehicle, man. This is like over a million pounds. It looks like there's like multiple trucks in the line, but these are actually all tied together. This is just this is what I call a one load failure. You know, if you got a seal coat road with six inches of base, forget it, man. That road's gonna be completely destroyed. So this is the type of stuff that we're trying to battle down in our Eagle Four Trail area. You know, you get uh, a lot of distress that looks like this. Hopefully, you can see it, where you got a lot of just completely destroyed shoulders. Things are shoving all over the place. You got massive rutting occurring. You got uh, pop outs, a lot of flushing going on, alligator cracking, edge shoulders just been completely obliterated. So it's these heavy loads that are completely destroying uh, all the roads that we have down in the energy sector area. Uh, this is a pretty busy slide, uh, but I want to give you some background in terms of when did all this uh, energy sector stuff pick up and when did it start to affect us? So what it's showing here is uh, we got these condition scores, right? Every year we need to go out and come up with a condition score for every road in the, uh, every state of Texas, or for every county. And we broke it down for the averages. So the Texas Commission back in uh, 2001, they put down the gamut, right? They said we want 90% of our roads to be in good or better condition. So what you see here is uh, for each individual county in the San Antonio area, what that percentage was in 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16. But the two I want to focus on are these two that are in the energy sector area. So at Escosa, man, we were looking damn good in 2011. Then things slowly started to get worse until 2016 when the bottom dropped out. And McMullen, you know, it was all right. We were doing okay. And then come 2015, man, it was 38% good or better, which is an extremely low number. It's funny, when, when you talk to the, uh, the maintenance supervisor down there about it, and we're like, man, you know, we, we went back through the numbers to make sure it was accurate, and man, the numbers are what they are. And he's like, 38? Man, I thought it was way worse. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a really rough situation, you know? So long story short, we got some crazy heavy uh, traffic going through there. We got limited funds at the time, and we're getting more invigorated by the passage of Prop 1 and Prop 7. Uh, but we got to come up with new and innovative ways that we can try and build these roads. Uh, and an old mentor of mine, actually Robert Lee, told me that when you're trying to give a presentation, you should have a theme, you know, what you're trying to do to try and catch everyone's attention. So one of the themes I wanted to go with is what we call old and busted, old and busted versus new hotness. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, there's a movie that came out a couple years back called uh, Men in Black. So I stole this clip from that movie. Hopefully you guys can hear this. Is there any sound? No sound. See, I drive. Wow, that is loud. <laughs> okay, all right, let me try it again. 
Your memory's back. How come you don't remember the light of Zartha? I must have neuralized myself in order to keep the information for myself. Ah, good plan. Wait, wait, man, what you doing? I always do the driving. Wait, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I remember that. What you remember is you used to drive that old busted joint. See, I drive the new hotness. Old and busted, new hotness. Old busted hotness. All right, so that, there's my basic theme of some of the things I want to talk about. This is really not to poke any fun at uh, uh, anyone in particular. It's just talking about uh, some of the issues we have going on and how we need to try and come up with new innovative ways and how we're going to try and attack the problems we have in that area. So uh, when we talk about old busted, um, this is a picture of the reclaiming unit that we have in our in-house uh, special cruise forces. Uh, it, it's a great machine. It does a good job, but to try and attack these type of failures that we have going on, on the road, man, it, it was never meant to try and handle the type of rehabilitation we got to do, especially with in-house forces. So we ended up uh, hooking up with the folks over at TTI, and we ended up getting our hands on the new hotness. Man, this sucker looks like a Batmobile. This thing's like 400 horsepower, a raw beast animal. It's just, this thing is going to tear through some material. So. Uh, the basic idea is that it can do a couple of different processes. Um, both of these are actually not a new process, but getting the equipment is new to us. That's why I call it new hotness. So there's one called the foamed asphalt. Basically what I want to show in this picture is that uh, the cool thing is, you know, you got this drum that's tearing up the pavement right here, but you got these two separate lines that come in. One can shoot in uh, asphalt, typically a PG-6422 and some water. Super heated up, so once that water hits that super hot oil, it uh, immediately vaporizes and causes that stuff to foam up to get, get some good coating. But it's also pretty darn good because you could also shoot in whatever else you want. In this case, we were actually looking at trying to in, uh, institute some emulsion instead. You don't need the two bars, but because the beast is so strong, man, we can throw some emulsion in there and try to mix it up. So uh, it was Research Project 6880. Uh, uh, a part of the research project, TTI was able to purchase the WR250, the new hotness, and we wanted to try and put it on the road in FM99 to McMullen County. So uh, McM this particular road, FM99, is way down south here in McMullen County. It, it spans uh, Choke, Canyon. Choke Canyon. There you go. A little bit closer look. Uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar with our PMIS scores, uh, it's color coded to let you know how good or bad it is. So red's bad, green decent, blue, man, blue's real good. So, but what you end up seeing is, uh, for the most part, over here on this northern portion of the road, you know, you see a little bit red definitely up here, some not good areas. Sorry, I'm colorblind. I just know it's not blue. So, <laughs> the other areas are not so hot. We had a lot of failures going on that road. Uh, so, the existing roadway was, it was a seal coat with about, you know, 11 inches of some pit run base. And this is the way the road looked like before we attacked it, right? It's falling apart. The maintenance section's going in there, trying to do patches throughout, just try and hold it together. So uh, we ended up hooking up with the folks at TTI. We wanted to try and utilize this equipment. So we came up with two different uh, systems. One where we're going to try and do 10 inches of either foamed or emulsion treatment with some lime treatment at the same time, and then try and cover it up with a one core surface treatment. Designs look good. We ended up identifying uh, a total of eight centerline miles, four over here on the northern end of FM99 and four here on the southern portion of F FM99. And this was how we were going to attack the game plan. First, we said, okay, day one, man, we're going to bring in a lime truck. We're going to treat 4,000 feet in one lane. The next day, we're going to move that 4,000-foot train with the lime, and we're going to go on to another 4,000 feet. And behind that, we're going to bring in the beast, work in new hotness, and start treating it on. So by uh, come Friday, we'll have about 16,000 feet that we're ready to just cover up with one course surface treatment. And, and then reality sets in, right? <laughs> so we immediately ran into some issues because we... <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, man, that's some good stuff right there. Woo! Hopefully it's been. Okay, so we had old busted going out there. Let's let old buses take care of the lime. Uh, old busted take care of the lime treatment. The problem with it was is that because it was so old and we were going 10 inches deep, it couldn't handle that amount of work. So we'd run it for like 40 minutes and then it'd overheat, and then the guy would just sit on his butt for 20 minutes waiting for it to cool down. 
So we were getting no production out of it. So we had to try and regroup. We said, all right, forget it. We're not going to mess around with Old Busted anymore. Let's just let new hot... Closet right here. This is one thing I really want you to take a notice of because this is one of the things that we ended up finding out with production as well. You look behind here and you see that the stuff is really well graded. You know, it's pretty uniform in terms of how it's pulverizing that existing material. If you go back and you look at what it looks like behind Old Busted when it was doing it, you get these huge chunks of seal coat that never got mixed up and never broke up. We go back and we run the FWD on these sections after the fact, the sections that had new hotness versus Old Busted. And there is a significant difference in terms of the stiffness of that material. It's doing much better when we get the good pulverization of that roadway. So that was another benefit, just switching over to this Monster Beast application. So then we had to scale back. We said, OK, old busted. You're, you're good, but you're not going to be able to help us out in this application. Let's change up our game plan. So instead of trying to do 16,000 feet in a week, we had to break it up into about a mile uh, a week. So Monday, Tuesday, we would do lime application, and then Wednesday, Thursday, we'd come back in with the, with the foam or with the emulsion, and then Friday, we'd cover the whole thing back up with one core surface treatment. Uh, so the equipment is incredible. Uh, the only video I showed you there was with the lime application, but what we ended up having to doing with either the foam or the asphalt is we actually had to hook up uh, the water truck and an asphalt transport directly to the work end. You put both of these equipments into neutral, and you let the work and do all the pushing, the pulling. So it's got completely full water truck, completely full asphalt tanker, tearing up 10 inches of base. And it was going like, uh, we had to scale it back because it could go faster. I think we were getting about 30 foot a minute. I think that's how fast we were going. It, it's, it was pretty awesome. So it was moving right along. You know, this is the way it looked after uh, first day's production with uh, foam treatment, not too bad. Immediately after, you know, you end up getting this nice smooth looking road uh, after the fact. When you compare it dollar-wise, uh, for us, San Antonio, when we're trying to come up with estimates for plans in terms of how much it's going to cost to try and reconstruct or rehabilitate a road, typically we're looking around $290,000 a lane mile, which means if we were trying to do all 16 uh, lane miles in this stretch of road by contract, that'd be about $4.6 million. Being able, being able to do it in-house and being able to utilize our own forces to try and do all this work, uh, it was going to be about $1.43 million. But we wanted to throw in a two-inch overlay, and that ended up coming out to about $2.2 million. So there was a significant cost savings in, just in terms of being able to do it in-house. The thing that I didn't include in this cost estimate was the cost for labor, because I just kind of call that a wash, since we're going to have to pay for it anyway, since it's in-house staff doing all the work. Now, is it all rainbows and lollipops and unicorns? No, it's not. Uh, I mean, we, uh, the... In terms of stiffening up a pavement and doing it quick and having you open the traffic, yeah, I am, I'm, I'm pretty convinced it can do that. But if you're expecting a nice smooth ride after you try and utilize this, equi this equipment, you're kind of, well, I have not seen that happen. Uh, so unfortunately, we did have some issues. We had some areas where it wasn't super smooth and we had some issues with bonding. So there are some areas where we had to go in there and do some level, level up. But in terms of the stiffness and the structure of that road, roadway, it is stout. It is strong, strong. Uh, in those areas where we did start to see, start to see some uh, surface distress, we went out and we pulled cores just to say, you know, if we're, if we're pulling a core and we're throwing water into that core bit while we're trying to pull out a core and it holds together, well, that's, you know, proof in the pudding. That stuff held together. If I try and do that through flex space, I'm just going to get a pile of, of trash. So this is what the core looked like immediately after it came out. It looks like hot mix, man. Stuff held together. It's stout, even in the distressed areas on the surface. So just kind of reiterating, if uh, you could put an overlay or level up, uh, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, so some things that we learn about uh, just trying to go through the process in case anybody's interested. Uh, sequencing of the rolling blading compaction is very critical. Uh, for me, if I had to put all my money to one guy in terms of trying to do this operation, it would be the blade man. The blade man is where the money comes from, man. He's the one that really controls the slope, the profile, the smoothness of that road. Uh, it keeps it, you know, nice and smooth. Uh, 
I would prefer to see Prime Coat or Fox Seal be put on top of some of this uh, material before we cover it up. Um, make sure you get good pulverization and try and keep track of your moisture contents. Those are all the critical points that we saw. Uh, okay, so I'm going through it in a breeze. Uh, so now I want to jump into a different way that we want to try and tackle a different section. This one's on SH-97 and SH-72. Still in McMullen County, but over in the far uh, western portion of it. Excuse me. So I was trying to look for some old historical photos of the intersection before we tried to touch it. Uh, so this, this is the only thing I could find on Google Maps, unfortunately. I didn't have any good historical representation. It doesn't do a really good, it doesn't do it justice in terms of how bad this intersection was. The one thing that you'll see is you'll see a lot of pushing going on. Obviously a lot of patches have gone on in this area. Uh, but that's because the maintenance section was having to spend, you know, an upwards of forty-five dollars to $32,000 a year just to maintain the intersection alone. If you went out there, you know, before they went in and did some level up and sealed it up, it would really, it really looked like an IED went off in the middle of the road, just a huge explosion. The intersection was just being completely torn apart. Heavy trucks, uh, a lot of turning movement, a lot of shear occurring that was just tearing the road apart. So uh, in 2014, we got very, very lucky. We got, uh, we got hooked up with Andy Naranjo, uh, the Ridger Pavements branch manager, and he said uh, the FHWA is doing a call out if anybody's looking for any innovative techniques because they're willing to chip in additional money if you guys want to do an innovative technique. And that's when uh, the idea came about trying to do something called a precast concrete panel. Uh, FHWA looked at it. They said, this is a great idea. We like it. Funded. So we got an extra $300,000 from the FHWA to actually look at trying to implement this type of technology on the roadway. Um, the design of it in terms of thickness it kind of follows the same idea for JCP because we're not doing post tensioning. If, if I had to try and correlate to anything, it would be like doing a uh, pavement design for a jointed concrete pavement. That's the system we were going to try and go with. Excuse me. So a lot of dowel bars are going to end up being used in this type of application. Uh, this is a, a layout of the intersection. If you're looking at it from the way the roadway exists, this would be SH-97 coming this way, and this is SH-72 coming in this way. We did want to try and keep it fairly uniform, so we ended up just going with three different panel sizes to try and account for uniformity and make sure we don't mix up the panels <laughs> where they're supposed to go. We went out to bid, and uh, unfortunately, locally, we only had one local precast yard that was willing to play ball. Only one uh, uh, bare concrete said they were willing to go ahead and try and do the investment to try and to make the forms for making these precast concrete panels. So when it went to production, uh, this is kind of the way it looked. You know, they're heavy panels, but instead of trying to bring in a crane, they end up bringing in this huge monster uh, excavator that could actually handle trying to port, uh, move the, uh, the panels around, put them in place. Just to give you an idea how easy it was, So I'm going through it in a blur. Uh, I, I'm trying to keep it short for the sake of brevity, but there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Number one, we end up going with a four inch hot mix layer underneath it. Uh, typical textile design, you can either go with four inches of hot mix or a one inch bond breaker with a six inches of cement treated base. We went this, right, this route to try and help out with the construction phasing for the contractor and make it done, make it quick. The only reason why I mention it is because we had tight grade control. We needed to have that stuff nice and smooth so we wouldn't have a lot of air voids underneath. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but all throughout each one of these panels, you have a bunch of different ports where, let's say, for example, they went into an area and a rock or something like, like that got wedged underneath or we didn't get a smooth profile. You could actually pneumatically pump grout directly in through the uh, panel in, in case you needed to try and jack up one side or try and move it around. And then there were additional jacks to try and uh, push it up as well. Once those were all put in place, each one of these holes right here is where a dowel bar was going to sit. So once it gets put in place, you put the dowel bar recess directly into the panel. Then there's this little port where you can put a stick in, move the dowel bar across, and then you ground it all in. Uh, so this is kind of what it looked like. I only had a video from partial opening, but I did want to let you guys see what it looks like open to traffic. So 
not not a lot of problems with it. You know, went in, opened up it up, opened it up to traffic. Uh, didn't see a lot of movement going on at all. Uh, it took a minute to get it there, but once it was in place, you know, I think we're going to have a good intersection. We're not going to have to mess around with for a long, long time. In terms of cost, ooh, yeah, they're pricey. They're real expensive. Uh, because so there had been one precast concrete panel project done before up in Georgetown, and I think that was what was it like ten years ago or something like that, two thousand one. There you go. So as a result, no one's done this in a long time, right? So we were kind of the guinea pigs. We knew the dollar value was going to be real high because all the precast players are like, well, man, am I going to make the investment on making these forms? What's a, you know, what am I going to get out of it? So the price is going to be high. Uh, the good thing is that now the at least one uh, producer has the forms in place trying to recreate the magic is there. So we're anticipating just the uh, panel to, uh, production would be about 200 bucks a square yard, but that does not incorporate all the costs it's gonna be to try and mobilize those panels out and try and install them. I don't know, rough guess uh, for today's value, I would hope it went down to maybe 375 bucks a square yard, but whatever, it's expensive. The benefit on doing that is uh, hopefully we get some road user costs. You know, in our particular application, uh, it was fairly rural, the energy sector truck traffic had died down quite a bit by that time, so we didn't have to deal with a lot of a, uh, continuous ADT. Uh, so they had time to try and put it in. We took a minute to try and install them, but if you need to try and move it up, you know you could throw in extra crews to really try and set these in place very quickly. Uh, the durability, I get very excited about. I know it was expensive, but I feel very confident we're not gonna have to touch this intersection for as long as I'm here at least. Uh, so there's, and then there's going to be zero maintenance costs where before the maintenance uh, section was having to dump in 30 to 40,000 bucks a, a year just to maintain that intersection. Okay, that's all for me. I'll get out of here. Okay, nine minutes. I have a two minute warning thing set on my phone, so when it goes off, it's a two minute warning. Uh, Brett did a good job with the other two projects. Uh, this one I want to talk about really quickly. Uh, it's, it's something that the San Antonio District is doing uh, uh, in regards to, to trying out different materials uh, for projects. Uh, State Highway 16, it's in Atascosa County, right down there between Jordanton and Poteet. Uh, this project, we're just going to restore the road. Uh, it's two 12 foot lanes with eight foot shoulders. Um, so out there, 24% um, trucks. Um, Relatively high, um, but the subgrade modulus is very, very weak. I mean, you, you look at it, 4,000 to 7,000. Um, so existing roadway conditions, uh, the Google car doesn't do it justice. Uh, it's in much worse shape. You had cracking, rutting, you name it, it, it had it on the roadway. Um, so, and, and if, you, if you look at the bottom picture, down there. You can see we had a seal coat with just the, the lanes right here, but you can see that those cracks go all the way across. So when we were looking at this project, uh, we kind of had to try to find that sweet spot in there in regards to the, the speed of getting this project done, basically getting in, getting out, uh, and staying out uh, once we're done. Um, We've had several projects in the energy sector where we had used the uh, temporary traffic control signals uh, and we were constructing the project with using cement treated base and that for say example, six inches, another six inches of the regular flex base uh, and then putting two to four inches of hot mix on top of that. Well, you can't get those heavy trucks to, to run on that cement treated base. They tear it apart, okay? Uh, we would cement treat the base, let it cure, uh, go home for the weekend, the trucks would run on it, just totally destroy whatever we had done the previous week. So we needed something that was really, really durable uh, that we could open up to traffic almost immediately uh, and at least have the, the trucks run on it for, for a couple of weeks before we could get some hot mix on it. Uh, and that, so that was part of it, and then balancing the, the traffic control costs uh, with the durability and speed. So finding that sweet spot. Uh, so we had some boundary conditions on this project. Um, we couldn't raise uh, the profile of the road because we had some uh, floodplains uh, within the project. Uh, heavy truck traffic, multiple cross streets. Uh, it precluded us having uh, to having the ability to use the uh, one lane, two way temporary traffic signals. Uh, again, very weak subgrade. 
and then uh, limitations on our ability to dig down really deep uh, and, and, and bring it back up quickly uh, so we'd have a drivable surface at the end of the day. So um, we were using cement treated LRA uh, and it's regularly, regularly used by our maintenance forces uh, to do base, you know, base repairs, to do our repairs. Uh, and we wanted to try to use it uh, as part of the pavement design for this project. Um, one of the things that uh, our maintenance guys did is they, they mixed cement with the LRA. Uh, the problem is if you mix the cement with the LRA in a stockpile and you don't use it quickly, uh, you get a, a crusty stockpile uh, because the cement has time to absorb some of the moisture. Uh, so on this project, the contractor actually set up a pug mill in their yard to, to mix the cement right before placement. So this is what the pavement, uh, pavement section looks like. That's seven and a half inches of LRA uh, with 2% cement, uh, six inches of uh, type B hot mix, uh, and then two inches of the, two, the super pave, uh, the type C. So that's our pavement section. Um, the contractor, the first thing that they needed to do was excavate 15 and a half inches of the existing roadway material. Uh, it was a mixture of things. It really was. Uh, and then make sure that they proof roll the subgrade. Uh, so they're out here on State Highway 16. They're using uh, uh, flaggers with a pilot car for traffic control. Uh, so this is actually the, the active spot uh, where traffic is running. Uh, one of the things that the contractor did was, was uh, in the morning they milled off two inches of the, the top mat and they're, they're taking that off using that as wrap material. Um, so here they're digging down. Again, soil is that nasty clay, n very, very fine, no rocks in it whatsoever. Uh, so we wanted to stay out of that as much as possible. So after they excavated and proof rolled, they come back in here and they're dumping seven and a half inches of LRA uh, that's been cement treated uh, at their yard where they have the pug mill. <clears throat> so they're dumping it, they're dumping it out here. Uh, they're actually using a bulldozer uh, to come in here and, and do the initial leveling with a blade uh, and then, then, then going ahead and packing it down. And this layer is actually gonna serve as the driving surface, okay? So uh, they come in here, they do about 700 feet a day. And when I say 700 feet a day, it's not 700 feet, just one lane, it's 700 feet full width, okay? So they're doing a half section, turning around, flipping traffic over, doing the other section. And that's what it looks like when they're done for the day. Uh, and just to go back here, oops, that right there, uh, what we've, what we've tried to do is Monday through Thursday being do, doing LRA and then and then Friday going ahead and putting the second uh, layer on which is your six inches of your type B uh, placed in two inches or yeah two inch two equal lifts uh, and then this serves as a temp also a temporary driving surface all the way to the end of the project so you can get that that top mat of the C on there so that's what the the B mix looks like. Oh, I got my two-minute warning. What? So, uh, of course, we haven't got to the final course yet. Um, so, no picture. Uh, several, several things with the, the issues that we had during construction is the motors were not paying attention. We had a couple of minor fender benders uh, where people were not stopping for the flaggers and they weren't paying attention because they were there sitting here doing this. Uh, so we added some, some message boards uh, to forewarn them that they would have to stop at the flaggers. But my lovely friends at DPS and law enforcement, they really like me, or at least I hope they like me. So uh, they've helped us out within the project, just providing their presence uh, during construction. Uh, another thing is the finishing of the LRA. Um, the contractor tried to extend uh, the work zone, make it 900 feet instead of 700 feet. What that did is uh, it, sometimes we didn't get as smooth of a finish on the LRA uh, as we wanted to. Uh, so we did have some, some raveling on the surface. Uh, once they backed it back down to 700 linear feet a day, uh, it, it did much better as far as providing people with a good ride 
uh, until it was covered up with the type B. Uh, width is not perfect, and, and I think this is on, on TxDOT. Over the years, you had a 40-foot uh, section of roadway, and maintenance has come out there, and they fixed drop-offs, or they've widened the pavement a little. Um, so when the contractor came in and milled, there, there's extra pavement out there. And we don't want, want that part mixed in uh, with, with our, our ditch when we get done. So that's going to have to be removed. Uh, maintaining access to streets and county roads, we've, uh, I've worked with the contractor on this. That's actually a county road right there. Um, I said, okay, we gotta, we gotta knock down uh, that edge right there uh, before we allow traffic on that side or we're gonna have a little Prius drop off and, and get hung up there. Drainage issues during events. And now granted, we're digging down 15 inches, we're coming back up with, with seven and a half inches of LRA. So for potentially a week, you have a vertical face there um, that's you know, still eight inches down. So we're working with the contractor to make sure that they knock down that, verti that vertical face on the outside edge of pavement. Uh, I, know they, I know they like it because it's a nice little, you know, they can butt up their type B right next to it, uh, but it really does hurt us uh, if we get a rain event. Cost for the typical section. Uh, did some rough calculations. About $41, $42 square foot. So not bad. Uh, we're, we're trying something different. We're trying kind of that medium area between having a cement treated flex base section uh, and full depth hot mix. You know, so we're trying to get that nice little happy median in there with that middle, that middle cost. Um, the speed of construction's uh, a lot better than your, your cement treated flex base section. Uh, and it's, it's really good to be able to get the traffic on it uh, right away. So we'd like to, to thank a couple yeah, folks. I did. The, uh, sorry we put this at the end. <clears throat> this really ties more back to the partnership that we had with uh, TTI and trying to get our hands on that working reclaimer. Uh, there were a lot of parties, and they, there were big players that really helped us out in trying to get that thing out to try and help out with the road. Chris Clancy over at RTI was, I mean, he, he was a force of nature. That guy really helped trying to get things mobilized to get the equipment. And Michael Lee and Dalton Pratt from maintenance division and FOD, they were huge helps in terms of getting it there. And then Matt Jordan from uh, our purchasing department trying to get our hands on materials that we don't normally use was a huge help as well. So I do want to send them out kudos because they were very, very helpful on the FM99 job. <laughs> 